Thank you very much. I'd like to talk to you uh, to share some of my experience in, in uh, offshore drilling management that comes out of, uh, <clears throat> as Tarat said, uh, beginning with um, the Deepwater Horizon and, and really moving into more international venues. Um, I'd like to start, uh, we've had a, really just a wonderful overview of, of some of the habitats in the Mediterranean Sea and in the territorial waters of Israel. Um, really fantastic uh, deep sea corals, cold seeps, as, as you've seen some, some remarkable places. Um, but these aren't entirely isolated from shallow water habitats and from uh, human existence. Uh, the deep sea gives us a lot of different things, provides a lot of different ecosystem services. The fisheries that are moving into deeper and deeper water, of course, is one of the most direct ways that um, they provision uh, resources to humans. But they also function in carbon sequestration, nutrient regeneration from deep waters that can then upwell to the shallows. Uh, genetic resources increasingly looking into deep sea species, corals and sponges for antimicrobial agents, uh, anti-cancer drugs that are all being developed today. Um, these processes are maintained in a lot of different ways and, and our economy has become to rely more and more on the deep sea um, for its many benefits. And I just wanted to give you a few examples and show you some of these places uh, that I've studied. Many of these are in the Gulf of Mexico, which has a lot of similarities to the Mediterranean basin, just not only in, in the size and in the types of habitats that are there, uh, the, but also the, the hydrocarbon, oil and gas resources that are there. This is a deep sea coral reef from about 500 meters in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and here these corals build up over hundreds of thousands of years. This reef is at least 300,000 years old. Um, they recycle nutrients that are coming down from the surface, metabolize the carbon, and then put back the phosphates, nitrates that will then upwell back to the surface and fuel surface productivity, which then drives uh, a lot of the um, goes through the food web and up into the fisheries. This is one of the species, uh, Liopathies of black coral that you just saw a lot of pictures of in your waters. Again, these can reach ages of 2,000, 3,000, even 4,000 years old. They directly provide habitat for a number of different fish species, including some commercially harvested fish species. Uh, this is uh, one picture when we had a remotely operated vehicle, an ROV on a deep sea Lophelia coral reef in the Gulf of Mexico, where uh, we couldn't get rid of these fish. They followed us around um, for about six hours on the seafloor, um, and these are also commercially harvested. Uh, it, they can be present on a lot of the rocky reefs as well. This again are the black corals that you can see, and these are the barrel fish from the Gulf of Mexico that can be, um, that are uh, sport fish in, in some cases. And the cold seeps too. This is a cold seep off of the East Coast of the United States, off of the Carolinas. Um, you can see the carbonates that are generated by the seep methane uh, that were just discussed a moment ago and all the fishes that find habitat, the crabs that find shelter there that breed in these places. Um, there can be large schools of fish coming down. This image is at about 300 meters. Even in places where there's only bacterial mats and the carbonates aren't there, you can see some of the methane bubbles coming out of the seafloor and these large schools of squid that come down to feed in these places. And, this is helping to sequester carbon in the deep ocean. Uh, the bacteria are limiting the methane release coming up out of the seafloor. And methane is an incredibly potent greenhouse gas. Um, so in addition to directly providing uh, habitat nursery grounds for fishes, they do these deep sea habitats do a remarkable number of things for us uh, that 
really affect life throughout the planet. Um, I have been working for a number of years with uh, this organization called the Deep Ocean Stewardship Initiative. I'm the lead of the oil and gas working group um, that I founded uh, shortly after the Deepwater Horizon incident. And this brings together an international group to try and provide the best scientific knowledge we can to advise managers. And um, within this network uh, include not only scientists, but um, government officials, resource managers, industry representatives. So we really try and bring all of the different perspectives of the different stakeholders together when we try and make these decisions. And, and let me just walk you through um, some of the, the findings and how we've applied these. So we uh, conducted a large extensive review of all of the literature that we could find on, on oil and gas uh, impacts in deep waters. And we published this review article a few years ago. Um, most directly, the anchor chains that come off of uh, the oil rigs, which often are in deep water, are semi-submersible. They're essentially floating islands. Um, they rarely have this kind of infrastructure and this image that extend all the way to the seafloor, but that does um, still take place uh, occasionally. Um, you can have anchor scars and debris around the seafloor that go out at least 100 meters from any emplacement, um, cuttings, elevated barium concentrations, uh, changes in organic carbon and redox conditions in the sediments out 300 meters at least, but occasionally one to three kilometers. And you can see some of the actual data here uh, that show the presence of drill cuttings and and changes in the benthic communities on the seafloor out two to 300 meters, in some cases up to two or three kilometers. Um, a lot of this has improved and, and these distances have been somewhat reduced with the elimination of oil-based drilling muds and the use of water-based fluids, um, lubricants uh, uh, in a lot of the drilling operations. This has gotten a lot better in recent years, although those um, Oil-based muds are occasionally still used in, in a few jurisdictions. They've largely been eliminated from operations, which has been um, really a, a big change in, in the types of impacts that we see in deep water. Um, so how do we apply this? Uh, this is an image from the deep Gulf of Mexico showing uh, this distribution of seismic anomalies and the, and the way that the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management manages the resources in the Gulf of Mexico is that they house all of the industry generated seismic data. And so um, this is how the industry locates deep seated reservoirs of oil and gas and the seismic data, there's very loud sounds that are projected down towards the seafloor. And then they reflect off of the seafloor, but they also penetrate the seafloor and go down a kilometer or two, a few kilometers to find um, these big pockets of oil and gas. But if you look at the seafloor expression, which is what this image is, um, the density, essentially the composition of the seafloor um, changes how that sound is reflected. And so the brighter colors of the red, yellows that you see here are highly reflective seafloor, which means that there are probably hard substrates there. That's what causes that reflectivity. Um, the lighter blue areas are soft seafloor where the sound is, isn't reflected, but absorbed by the seafloor, by the mud and mostly mud and sand that's down there. Um, and you can tell something about the types of communities that are down there just by this acoustic reflectivity because where you find the hard substrates those are the carbonates they're likely highly probable in this environment to have seep communities on them tube worms that can be hundreds of years old mussels um, the back even the bacterial mats which we were looking at before or uh, as these transition, these seep communities transition, and there's less hydrogen sulfide and methane, the toxic uh, chemicals that are coming out of the seafloor, as those begin to decline, you get deep sea corals moving in. And so over 
a few decades of research uh, in this area, we've, we've found that almost every one of these seismic anomalies where you get this highly reflective seafloor contains a potentially sensitive community. And so how they're managed is each of the seismic anomalies gets this red circle drawn around them that's done essentially by hand. Um, and there are approximately 30,000 of these in the deep Gulf of Mexico. And so around each of those features, which are in the light blue here, which I showed you in the previous slide, um, there is a small buffer zone around them, 600 meters, that oil and gas activity is not allowed within those zones. Um, now there, you can apply for a waiver to this and it can be reduced to 300 meters. And so um, you can put anchor chains within a few hundred meters of uh, deep sea corals, for example. And so that's right really on the edge of where we would expect to see impacts. Um, so what we, uh, well, let me give you a kind of a case study. This is one of the sites, um, a drilling rig in the Gulf of Mexico. You can see in white up there is the anchor plan. So each of those numbers represents uh, anchor chains and then anchor emplacements. Um, the, in green on that same figure are places where they have found in their mapping uh, hard bottom communities that are not showing up in the seismic data. So there are rocks, individual rocks, individual accumulations of coral that aren't big enough to show up in the seismic data, but show up in their high res resolution mapping. And then in the inset is a site that we've been working for a number of years where there are corals and seep communities. And those are our high resolution bathymetry that we acquired by uh, an autonomous underwater vehicle, an AUV. Um, so what does that look like on the seafloor? This is a, a deep sea coral. This is Lophelia. This is a close up. The material in the background that you can see streaming by, it's actually, the current is so strong that it's, it's going up across the screen here. Um, we collected a lot of this material and measured elevated barium concentrations. And this is approximately four kilometers away from the site of active drilling. So it really depends on the local oceanographic conditions and where you have very strong current flow, you can get elevated barium and cuttings much, much further than you would um, in a, a typical scenario where you don't have the active current. So it's very important to do this on kind of a case by case basis. Um, and so what we've suggested is that rather than, than 200 or 600 meters, um, that the buffer zones around each of these areas should be closer to two kilometers. And we're still in active discussions with the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management about, about increasing these sizes. But this brings the point that even in the very active Gulf of Mexico, where there are thousands and thousands of oil rigs, and it's one of the most heavily developed areas of the ocean floor in the world, there is still this network essentially of marine protected areas where there is no oil and gas activity allowed. Um, this isn't really well publicized, I don't think, um, but is a, has been a fairly effective management strategy to prevent impacts in some of these really sensitive communities. Um, and we're working to improve that. Now, what we're not managing for is something like this. And this is the deep water horizon shortly after it exploded and before uh, collapsed onto the seafloor. Um, this was uh, a really monumental event. It's the largest accidental oil spill in the history of man. Um, and 11 people lost their lives uh, during this incident and uh, 40 or more were injured at the time. And it has taken years to really fully appreciate the impacts of the spill both on the natural world and on uh, the human economy and, and, and life around the Gulf Coast. Um, we're really not just now starting to get into the restoration of some of these communities, which I'm not gonna have time to get into today, but I'd be happy to discuss with anyone later. Um, so these are the general impacts. The light blue in the, the map there is the 
extent of the surface oiling. So that's where there were large oil slicks on the surface. Um, the inset there where there were high uh, oil concentrations on the seafloor. And this is where we started to look for impacts to the deep sea coral communities. Um, so this is a, a larger blow up of some of that industry house seismic data. Uh, and we designed a, a research cruise around some of these locations where we could go visit them. We brought an autonomous underwater vehicle that's uh, Sentry from Woods Hole Oceanographic. And we conducted a lot of mapping around these areas. So on one dive, we would look at um, this image, which I showed you before, and we would choose some of these areas. We would fly these sort of, you know, mow the lawn, uh, if you will, over some of these areas, produce very high resolution bathymetry. And then the vehicle would drop down and would acquire photographs, which uh, we had to dig through millions and millions of photos to find coral communities. And then we would go down and look for impacts at those sites. And what we found um, in these areas. So you're looking at the, the circles represent areas where there were high concentrations of hydrocarbons found on the seafloor. Um, this inset shows you where some of the sites that we discovered of deep sea coral uh, impacts in the, those red dots. Um, and when we synthesized all of that information, we put it together into these different zones of impact. Um, where the most severe impact right around where the wellhead was, there really weren't any coral communities, any hard grounds, but there were extensive impacts to the soft bottom communities. Uh, and then as we went out into the orange, there were pretty, pretty extensive impacts. Um, the yellow were more minor and the green were present, detectable, but not um, very extensive. But those impacts to the coral communities go out approximately 25 kilometers from the deep water horizon location. So if we take our 30,000 seismic anomalies, which are here in black, and we draw a 25 kilometer buffer around each of them, the area that would be open to drilling in the Gulf of Mexico is depicted here in red. Um, Needless to say, this uh, management strategy did not make it very far in um, the U.S. policy sphere. So uh, I'm not sure that this is an effective management strategy for the Gulf of Mexico, um, but it could be an effective manage management strategy in other areas where oil and gas is just beginning to be developed. Um, this is being considered in, in places like South Africa and Canada. Um, in uh, Trinidad and Guyana, um, which we've had sort of mixed success in, in our negotiate, ongoing negotiations with a lot of those different countries. Um, and I would suggest that um, this is a technique that could possibly be implemented uh, here in Israel. Um, this is just an image of the distribution of existing oil rigs in the Gulf of Mexico. These are actually um, production platforms and, and don't include just the drilling rigs and the exploratory drilling that's going on in the Gulf of Mexico. You can see how that's expanded into deeper and deeper waters in more recent years. Um, so we're really sticking with the two kilometer buffer zone. Uh, we're trying to get to the two kilometer buffer zone in, in the US, but we can do better um, because accidents will happen and the probability of an accident increases with the depth of drilling. Um, and that's tip, those are typically small accidents, but the, the combined release of oil from all the small accidents in the world uh, is actually annually greater than what occurred during the deep water horizon. So even preventing these small spills is very important. And, preventing the, the ecological impacts of those small spills is, is very significant. Um, the other thing is that they're not, these aren't isolated sites. Um, as I said in the beginning, that the deep ocean's not disconnected from shallow waters. They're very tightly connected. Uh, and this is a concept that we put forth in a paper that came out last year. Um, where there are a lot of fishes and fishery, important fishery species, um, especially the snapper grouper complex that 
go through their life history using a wide variety of habitats from the estuaries and salt marshes um, out into seagrass beds and then deeper into the deep water coral habitats that are hundreds of meters, 400, 500 meters deep. Um, and so just in the life cycle of a single individual, they use all of these different habitats. And so um, I was actually very glad to see the, the proposed design of the marine protected areas uh, that would encompass a lot of these different types of habitats. And, and you really need to be, should be focusing on, on protecting these corridors and ensuring that you can just in as terrestrial land-based management has moved in this direction where you have networks and you have migration corridors and building bridges over highways, for example, for, for deer to migrate from one place to another. Um, we should be thinking about the same thing underwater and ensuring that these fish have a way to get from the shallow water habitats, even rivers, all the way out to the deep sea corals without having to run the gauntlet of miles of oil rigs and and human disturbance that would make it very difficult for them to complete their life cycle um, so with that i just i uh, want to thank a lot of people who have uh, from the deep ocean stewardship initiative and a lot of people who contributed to this research uh, i'd be happy to take any questions that you have